How firm a climate foundation? There have been a number of claims based on climate change, and we've documented some of these two weeks ago. We need to plant trees. We need to conserve fossil fuels. We need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels by 80%. Ooh. Well, we'll actually see where that comes from. And we need to join the, rejoin, actually, the Paris Climate Accords. And finally, we need to adopt an international day of rest. Um, all of those arguments have been made. Now, the question that I have is how firm is the foundation for that, those kinds of claims? I will start out by saying there's obfuscation on both sides of the issue. People saying things that just flat out aren't true. Um, and um, it, it actually starts with climate change itself which is really global warming. If you don't have directional change, there's no point. And weather gets colder, it gets hotter, that's been around for a long time. The claim that's being made is that it's going to get hotter. And the question that I'll raise is, how does the non-specialist decide? I've done a little research, but I haven't done everything, and uh, I've probably done more research than some of you, and the question is, um, you know, when do you have enough information to actually have an opinion that uh, is better than listening to the last guy that talks to you? And I would suggest that the essence of science is transparency. Science is a study of the reproducible. If they're not giving you data that you can look at and that at least in theory you could repeat, um, then uh, it's not worth much. The one thing science never should be is authoritarian. authoritarian. Now, because of that, science can be authoritative. That is to say, people who are transparent, you can see what's behind them in, and, and what's behind them really does count because what you're trying to do is ascertain what nature has to say to you. And they can be a guide. But the instant that they put themselves up as the authority, rather than passing you on through to the data, science has started to become corrupt. It's only a matter of time before it, uh, uh, be or it becomes completely corrupt. So if somebody says, trust me, I'm a scientist, I'm sorry, that is the worst thing you can do. I want to see your data. So watch to see who's presenting data and who is um, telling you to trust. There are four questions that we will go through. One, is there global warming? Number two, assuming there is, is it caused by humans versus, say, the sun? Number three, is it harmful? Is there historical data? And finally, what should be done about it? And of course, the answer to the first three questions determine what happens to the fourth. And the answer to the first question determines how you're going to look at the second and third. Well, let's look at the first question. Is there global warming? According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and again, you can look this up, you do not have to trust me about it. There is global warming over the last, since 19, probably 15 or so. Well, actually, the latest corrected analysis. So, yeah, it's adjusted data. We're going to discuss that in just a minute. Um, it shows that the rate of global warming has continued. There's been no slowdown, according to this. 
Um, I assume that this is 1998, which is interesting. Well, um, now, do we have any unadjusted data? Well, we actually do. And um, the place I could find it is Roy Spencer. Roy Spencer, by the way, is not a climate denier. As he explains in his blog, on the flip side, I routinely engage skeptics who claim there is no such thing as the greenhouse effect, that it is physically impossible for the cold atmosphere to make the surface warmer by increasing its CO2 content anyway. No matter how many different ways I try to show how they are wrong, they never change their stance. If you were to ask Roy Spencer whether he believed in anthropogenic climate change, I think he would be forced to say yes. This is satellite-based temperature of the global atmosphere. And this is pretty much all the data we have. Um, there, is, uh, there were two satellites actually, one of them in this range and then one of them along here and then one of them, uh, well actually, uh, both of them along here, so you could, you could match them to each other. And then a new satellite went up because the old one kind of went on the blink. Um, assuming the matching has been done well, it looks like there's global warming. If I were drawing that by eyeball, that's probably what I'd get. I didn't bother to, to do the uh, math, but you can look at it, and I think you would agree with me on that. Um, so there's been, according to this, from about point, uh, minus point 0.2 to about plus point 0.4. A little less here, a little less here too, so uh, 0 0.6 more or less. Um, uh, by the way, uh, you'll notice that this is very minor uh, what they've done is they've done a centered 13-month average, and so what that does is that neatly gets rid of the year-to-year uh, -year, uh, temperature change, which of course is monstrous. Now, if you look at this, you think, well, hum. Let's uh, take a look at it. First of all, like I say, that's got to be the 1998-1999 El Nino, which means that this point right here is 2000. And that means that if you're going to show where the other one started, it's about there. So if you compare that with, uh, uh, with, with this graph, uh, if you come out across there and draw, it really should be up here because there's a couple of extra years on the other graph. Uh, but let's take a more conservative one. Um, the length is about there. If you move that over to the scale, it's 0.8, which is a little larger. It suggests that there's a small amount of uh, adjustment. Um, Maybe more, actually, because um, the, the data on the other graph is supposed to be where carbon dioxide has its most prominent uh, effect. What's the previous figure? Pardon me? What's the previous figure? Well, you want to go back to the previous figure? Let's see. Sorry about that. Uh, there's the previous figure, and um, uh, there's the El Nino, by the way, 1998. And you'll notice that until the new El Nino came, there was not any global warming for a little while. If anything, if you're going to start from here, it was going down. But now with the new El Nino, you can say, well, it's slowly going up. 2000. 
Um, you're right. You're right. So they're actually pretty close to each other. Um, 0.5 on the other one would have given you 0.9 on this one. So they're actually pretty close to each other. Um, so let's just go through that quickly. And uh, um, if you were to draw it, ignoring the ignoring the change in uh, uh, in in degrees, you might you might possibly say that the slope should be higher. But uh, with an adjustment, it actually matches pretty well. Um, well, how trustworthy are the results on the ground? Well, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that there's a PhD thesis of John McLean at James Cook University. And it's, uh, there's a couple of websites that you can get the main parts of it. Um, I haven't read the whole thesis. Um, but the summary that's given at the second website is the Hadley data is one of the most cited, most important databases for climate modeling. That's Hadley and the Climate Research Unit at East Anglia University, uh, or the University of East Anglia, actually, be technical. And um, thus, for pol policies involving billions of dollars, McLean frowned freakishly improbable data and systematic adjustment errors, large gaps where there is no data, location errors, Fahrenheit temperature reported as Celsius, and spelling errors. Almost no quality control checks have been done. Outliers that are obvious mistakes have not been corrected. One town in Colombia spent three months in 1978 at an average daily temperature of over 80 degrees centigrade. Just for, um, if you were to take the world record temperature outside of Colombia, it would have been uh, 50, 758 degrees centigrade, and that would be in the Sahara with uh, Death Valley close behind. Uh, so it's Columbia there for a while was, what, 20 degrees above everywhere else, which is a little hard to believe. One town in Romania stepped out from summer in 1953 straight into a month of spring at minus 46 degrees centigrade. These are supposedly average temperatures for a full month at a time. It must have been really cold there. Um, St. Kitts, a Caribbean island, was recorded at zero degrees centigrade for a whole month and twice. Looks to me like somebody just simply t took some numbers and put them across, maybe added a minus 40, minus to the 46. I, no, it's, that'd be hard. Um, 46 is pretty hot itself, so I'm not sure what happened to those numbers. But somebody obviously didn't edit them. Temperatures for the entire southern hemisphere in 1850 and for the next three years are calculated from one, just one site in Indonesia and some random ships. That's probably not the fault of the data itself. That's just the fault of we didn't have much data. Sea surface temperatures represent 70% of the Earth's surface. But some measurements come from ships, which are logged at locations 100 kilometers inland, which, of course, would be a little cooler, usually. Others are in harbors, which are hardly representative of the ocean, open ocean. So uh, if, you're doing, if you're taking temperatures from the intake inlet of the, uh, of the engine cooling system, uh, which is one of the standard ways of doing it, it's a little hotter than what you get if you lower a bucket down to the sea and then pull it up and check the temperature. But, it, but at least it's consistent. Um, you might have a significantly higher temperature in a harbor than you would as you're sailing between uh, ports. I once saw an exposition of the errors that were in the land data and noted that they could account for maybe half of the temperature increase. Um, which would make the satellite data um, a little more uh, accurate in terms of what you expect. 
um, make it make more sense out of it actually uh, because that's where the heating should be the most is where the satellite data gets most of its data from the important thing of the satellite data of course is that there um, there are only two instruments that will measure the entire earth that matches roughly the difference between the satellite warming data and the ground-based weather data and uh, so I think there's global warming just probably less than is generally alleged um, but half of the global warming data is still in reasonably impressive it's about a degree uh, and by the way it tends to be more in the poles than it does to be than it does in the equator and is global warming caused by humans well the short answer is yes we pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that's pretty much undisputed carbon dioxide is in fact a greenhouse gas we also increase the methane supply by cattle farming um, which uh, vegetarians like me would probably not mind if it got less methane in fact is a stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide although it's not uh, put out as much and therefore you might expect some global warming the real question is how much so um, then this is again Roy Spencer it has been calculated theoretically that if there are no ch other changes in the climate system a doubling of the atmospheric CO2 concentration would cause about one degree of surface warming one degree centigrade this is not a controversial statement it is well understood by climate scientists as, er as of early 2019 we were about 50 percent of the way toward a doubling of the atmospheric CO2 you're going to see a graph which suggests maybe 55 percent um, which uh, if you double it every time then that's kind of a log type curve uh, which makes sense if you're dealing with that kind of a uh, uh, of, of a, a absorption problem which is what we're looking at um, and by the way what that means is that if you go from uh, two parts uh, 200 parts per million to 400 parts per million uh, you go up one degree in order to get the next degree you have to go up to 800 parts per million all climate models therefore have to have some kind of multiplier or positive feedback if one is to account for all the warming with anthropogenic or man-made carbon dioxide this is the point of the hockey stick uh, you see if the climate has been going up and down and up and down uh, then you're going to have a terrible time figuring out what other factors besides man-made carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere is going on but if you know that the climate has stayed steady all the time and then suddenly took off when we started using carbon dioxide then you can use that to calculate the multiplier effect and the multiplier effect may very well be significantly positive and even positive feedback to the point of ca catastrophic so you really need to have the medieval warming period disappear if you're going to become somewhat of an alarmist there's the famous hockey stick courtesy of Wikipedia um, and you'll notice that there are there is uh, data that's supposed to come through here there's other data that's supposed to come through here go up to here and then it stops we're going to see why in a minute and then there's other data that starts here and this is actual temperature recordings that we can be reasonably comfortable are accurate um, 
and there's somebody superimposing a hockey stick so it's a little easier to see what they're talking about. And by the way, you'll notice this little glitch here. This happened in the 1970s and we're going to discuss that too. Um, there is, of course, controversy over the hockey stick and um, uh, something that I got from the uh, Wayback Machine because it has disappeared um, from the uh, university it used to be housed at, which means I guess if you want your papers to be on the internet, you better put them on yourself rather than rely on the university. Um, and then uh, uh, there's an interesting article uh, uh, that, that gives you a pretty fair idea of, of how uh, uh, climate change, uh, change believers uh, put it in Wikipedia. There's, there's other, other articles on the, on the net as well. Um, but uh, the article that uh, Let's see, it was Ross McKittrick, I think it was, uh, wrote, which is the first one on the, that list, uh, noted that in the first inter international uh, uh, panel on, on climate change uh, report was, in a governmental panel on climate change, had a medieval warm period from about, what, 1,000 to about 1,300 or so, um, the, cli the, uh, the climate was warmer than usual, and in fact, for most of that, was actually warmer than it is today. Um, and then uh, came the Little Ice Age, uh, and then at about 1912, uh, was the year without a summer, which was right after Tamboro uh, erupted. And then since then, we've been climbing. Uh, they had another graph that seemed to indicate the same kind of thing. This is uh, world climate history after AD 1000, according to ground borehole evidence. Uh, this was, again, in the IPCC report. Again, you see a medieval warming period, and then uh, emails were stolen or liberated, depending on your point of view, from the University of East Anglia, giving a fascinating insight into how AGW advocates think. And one particular email reads in part, and I'm leaving out the addresses and stuff. Dear Ray, Mike, and Malcolm, once Tim's got a diagram here, we'll send that either today or first thing tomorrow. Uh, I've just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years, that is from 1981 onward, and from 1961 for Keith's to hide the decline. That's an odd way of referring things. Mike's series got the annual land and marine values while the other two got April uh, through September for NH land, I think that's north of 20 north. The latter two are real for 1999, while the estimate for 1999 and for NH uh, combined is uh, 0 0.44 degrees centigrade. With regard to 61 to 90, the global estimate for 1990. Anyway, a bunch of data. Thanks for the comments, Ray. Cheers, Phil Jones. Phil is how he signed it. Phil Jones is the uh, head of the Climate Research Unit at East Anglia, or was. Um, what are they talking about by hide the decline? Sounds fishy. Maybe they're hiding the decline in temperature. That's what some people said. Not really, and Wikipedia is correct on this. The divergence problem is an anomaly from the field of dendroclimatology, the study of past climate through observation of old trees, primarily the properties of their annual growth rings. It is the disagreement between temperatures measured by the thermometers, which you know ought to be the primary data, right? 
and the temperatures reconstructed from late wood densities are in some cases width of tree rings in far northern forests. So there are two ways of doing it and uh, uh, two ways of estimating the, the temperature based on tree rings. And they have a graph, and you, you can see that the graph matches pretty well until you get to here, and here the temperature takes off, and the tree rings actually shrink. And hiding the decline is basically getting rid of these things that we know are, don't rep represent the temperature. And uh, there's the uh, the uh, text underneath that figure. Uh, Twenty years smooth plots of average ring width, dashed, and tree ring densities, thick line, averaged across all sites, is shown as standardized anomalies from a common base, and compared with equivalent area averages of mean April through September temperature anomalies which is the thin solid line. Let's go back and look at that. Uh, here you can see there's the thin solid line, um, temperature, and this is the, the late wood density and the ring width. And you can see that neither one of those really approximates the temperature. So you hide the decline by omitting those uh, data. Now, The deviation of some tree proxy measurements from the instrumental record since, again, this is Wikipedia, um, since the 1950s raises the question of the reliability of tree ring proxies in the period before the instrumental temperature record. Hmm. What that means is those proxies might not be as good as they think. And that's a, an important point. In more recent studies, evidence suggested that the divergence is caused by human activities and so confined to the recent past, but the use, but use of affected proxies can lead to overestimation of past temperatures, understating the current warming trend. Wait a minute. The use of affected proxies can lead to overestimated of past temperatures? would seem like it would be underestimated past temperatures. If you have the data in the present and the temperatures go higher than the tree rings predict, then you're underestimating the temperature. The question is which decline was hidden and as near as I can tell the decline is as Wikipedia stated it was not as sometimes misunderstood a decline in real temperature that they're hiding but a decline in proxies that did not match real temperature. And um, uh, the best data that I can find right now, I found some other ones that, that were easier to see but uh, I've lost them since because I looked at this a long time ago. Here is some data that was flat out deleted uh, when McKittrick went to research, re-research man's, uh, uh, the, the data again. And here's one that's hidden because obviously that's not right. The temperature went up. These ones also went down. And in fact, the data that I saw turned down as well there. And so what happens is you just kind of omit this, all of this data, and take the temperature because, after all, it's more reliable. Well, that's fine, except for one thing. If when the temperature goes way up, the tree ring proxies don't show it, how do we know that the temperature wasn't way up in this range and the proxies don't show it because they're incapable of doing so? Well, the answer, the short answer is you don't. So it's really kind of important to report all the data, and it's really kind of important to note that some of the data is, um, shall we say, less than stellar quality. And therefore, using tree rings to erase the medieval warm period probably isn't valid. Do remember that during the medieval warm period, uh, Newfoundland was branded as Vinland. I don't think too many people want to grow grapes 
in Newfoundland right now. Grapes were grown in northern England, um, which again is not very good uh, grape growing country right now. Um, and so it suggests that there was in fact a medieval warm period. But the question is, if we know that other things can cause global warming, then why should we attribute all of the warming now to, um, to anthropogenic effects rather than perhaps some of it? Then a model that assumed it was man-made would wildly overestimate the warming that would actually occur and control and the control that we could exert over the global temperature, at least by adjusting our carbon use. The question is, is there evidence for another influence on global temperature? Well, there is some. Now, there are also contraindications to this because some people have, have tried to, to uh, uh, find a uh, use for the sun, but um, um, Willie Soon actually put some data out. I've heard lots of people complain about he's not being fair, but I haven't seen too many of them that actually challenge the data itself. And the data is kind of spectacular, actually. Um, this is Arctic-wide surface air temperature record for the past 130 years, and it got published in geophysical research letters, which means it passed peer review, obviously. Um, and this is the match of the sun's total, uh, uh, total irradiance how much energy the sun is putting out to the earth. And if you adjust the numbers correctly, we don't know whether that's actually true or not, but, uh, but if you adjust them, they come out pretty close and actually a little closer than the carbon dioxide curve does, which is fascinating. Why? Why is it that that, that that does it? And I don't know that anybody has really answered that. And the question is, is this all only forcing from carbon dioxide or is some of the sun's irradiance making a difference? Um, now, the next question is, is global warming harmful? Because if it's happening, you know, maybe the harm is offset by other things. And in fact, if there's been a medieval warm period, it suggests that global warming isn't all that help, ha harmful. It probably is harmful for the region around the Sahara Desert, so yeah, it could be. Uh, but it's probably not harmful for Canada or Russia or Norway or Sweden or Finland. Uh, they kind of like a little more warmth at times, I think. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, global cooling may be far worse. According to Inquisitor.com, who's uh, uh, in an article that referred to Bill Gates wanting to cover the earth in a giant cloud to combat global warming. We'll come back to that. Uh, there's this interesting sentence as Ford ex uh, Forbes explains, volcanic eruptions have launched dust and debris into the atmosphere, causing periods of cooling and reduced sunlight that have had devastating impact on Europe's agriculture, leading to famine across the continent. Wait a minute. That sounds like global warming might actually be good for Europe, no? Um, at least a little bit of it. Well, what about hurricanes? The uh, best data that I could find on this uh, is again from geophysics uh, research letters and again is available online. And there is the total energy of cyclones. And as you can see, well, it went up in 2004, 2006, but it's 
come down in 2012. Unfortunately, this didn't carry it any further than that. But it's hard to make something that's been going steadily up since out of that data. Now, the next question is, given those facts, what should be done about global warming? Well, that depends on how bad it is and how much control we have. If we don't have much control, then it's probably not worth, uh, worth wasting our time. And if it isn't bad, if it's actually good, maybe we should be happy about it. Um, volcanoes, in fact, fight global warming, and maybe we should do something about it. So uh, maybe we should put reflective material in the atmosphere. And three um, substances have been suggested. One of them is water, or actually, to be precise, clouds. Um, one of them is putting sulfur dioxide way up in the stratosphere, not around the troposphere, although I wonder if the sulfur dioxide would come down eventually. And finally, we could put dust or fine particles that would reflect some light and maybe get us out of global warming. Although, again, maybe if we put ourselves into global cooling, it'll be worse. Um, and so a couple of people called uh, Lowell Wood and Ken, Ken Caldera have suggested putting sulfur dioxide. And uh, let's say they got a cool reception. Um, and you can read uh, in a number of different places, but the New Yorker is as good as any. Um, and then Bill Gates proposed, uh, you may have heard of that guy, uh, putting particles in the air by flying jet airplanes across. Um, I think there are some people who believe that's already being done and they're using aluminum and barium and poisoning the, uh, the uh, populace, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that one alone um, for now. And there's actually an article saying Bill Gates says we should do this. Um, now, one thing that could happen is we should encourage people to use their own solar panels. And that would have the additional side effect that they become more independent of the utility companies, and that might not be a bad idea. Um, as a matter of fact, in California right now, that's a pretty good idea because uh, they're having these blackouts every once in a while, and it might be kind of nice to have your own uh, electricity when the main system goes down. And it's solar, and therefore it's not putting out any uh, carbon dioxide, at least not after manufacture of the thing. But um, what is usually advocated is more government control. Carbon tax, or maybe even um, uh, just flat out control. We're going to get rid of the combustion engine. You may have heard of that um, by people who are advocating Green New Deal. Uh, it's probably futile. I don't think anybody's going to go there, frankly. Uh, the United States is out of the Paris cl Climate Agreement. And the interesting thing of it is that it's dropped its carbon output by about 30% or so. And um, again, you can look this up. Um, this is collected by What's Up With That, but it's actually uh, a university that did the, the research. And you can see that if you start at 100% at two th 2001, we dropped down to about 40%. And from the looks of it, it's probably going to continue to go down. Why is that? It's because we're using more natural gas and less uh, coal to make electricity. You know, if you really wanted to bring the uh, carbon emissions down, the thing to do would be build n more nuclear plants. But the people who do that are not really enthusiastic about that, even though France uh, gets a good share of its uh, electricity from nuclear power. 
both the Pope and the environmental community do not like te uh, technological solutions. We saw the Pope's comments two weeks ago. Why don't they want technological solutions? Well, I think it's because they have an agenda of their own. Their solution, clamping down on fossil fuel, is, I think, I impractical. Uh, but it makes for big government control, and there are those who kind of like that side effect. Um, the numbers, in fact, do not add up uh, if you're going to clamp down on uh, people as carbon emissions. For example, an 80% reduction in carbon emissions, in fact, the Waxman-Markey bill uh, advocated for 83% reduction. Um, and you can look it up. This is Wikipedia, so I don't think they're biased in favor of, uh, uh, of climate skeptics. And it says that the U.S. is uh, uh, the, well, the U.S. is uh, putting out six billion tons of CO2 per year, which they would reduce down, to, but then 83 percent would give you one billion tons, maybe 1.1, but for practical purposes, one which is about 20 tons per person per year, is what we're currently using. Uh, by the way, uh, 0.4 tons per year is just from breathing. So if you want to bring down the carbon emissions, I guess you could go around and killing every 10th person and probably bring them down. But I'm not sure that's where we want to go. Um, this. The last time we were down to uh, two and a half tons per person uh, was in 1905 or 1910, depending on whose statistics you're using. Well, that's not very good. In case you're wondering where I'm getting some of the statistics, it's from a, uh, a video that uh, uh, somebody pointed out that uh, seem to have their, their numbers pretty well straight. Um, in 2050, we'll have 420 million people if we keep on going at the rate we're at. Um, more, I suppose, if we have open borders. And uh, that means that we'll have to cut it down to 2.5 tons per person. Well, really 2.1 because you've got to count the, uh, the breathing. That would put us in the neighborhood of where we were in 1875, or where Belize or Mauritius or Somalia or Haiti are right now. Um, France and Switzerland, which get 90% of their power from nuclear and hydropower, which of course don't put out any uh, carbon, still have 6.5 tons per person. And of course, we're dealing with a much larger country, which means we ship things from Chicago to New York. And if you ship things from one end of France to the other, you aren't getting anywhere near that. Um, and so we're going to wind up with more uh, carbon. You know, we're not going to get there. Realistically, this is not going to happen. And right now, the biggest carbon polluter is not actually the United States. It's China. And they have made no promises whatsoever to bring their carbon footprint down. We'd be lucky if we have them level off at this point. Now, I think that planting trees, if you're going to go somewhere to try to bring it down, is much more realistic. And maybe some of those schemes that um, Bill Gates and some of his uh, compatriots are suggesting might not be that bad an idea if you're really trying to get carbon down. The question is, is it bad enough for us to even do anything about? Um, and finally, there is what I would call sloppy thinking. What's up with that? Uh, notes that um, the definition of climate was the average of a particular weather parameter over 30 years at one point. So that sounds good, 
And now what they're saying is the new definition is present level of global warming and it's defined as the average of a 30 year period centered on 2017, assuming the recent rate of warming continues. So you get to have 15 years, I should be 15 years over here so that you can see it, the present, and then 15 years in the future, which means that you're using made up data. That's an interesting way of doing science. Why not just use the present point and let it go at that? Well, as you probably know, this is all really important because we have 12 years left. Maybe it's 11 by now. But it's okay because in uh, 2006 in Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, we had 10 years left. 2006, 2016, we're all dead by now anyway. Um, and uh, interestingly, in the 1970s, there's some of you were around and can remember that it actually happened. There was this big scare on global cooling. Um, I was fascinated to read Wikipedia, and this is one of their comments on it. Some press reports in the 1970s speculated about continued cooling. These did not accurately reflect the scientific literature of the time, which was generally more concerned with warming from an enhanced greenhouse effect. Really? That certainly wasn't what was put out in the general, to the general public at the time, because I was there and I remember it. Um, Walter Cron Cronkite, Quoting Hubert, uh, Hubert Lamb, if you want to listen to him, you, there's actually a website that is captured where he has talked about how we're entering a new period of cooling. You can't get much more authoritative for that period in the literature than Walter Cronkite. And by the way, um, you remember the, uh, this little, some press reports, if you click on that, it talks about newspapers. Walter Cronkite was not exactly a newspaper, and he wasn't some. He was probably the most authoritative person, or at least the person, the most trusted person in news at that time. Um, again, I was there, I remember it. Also, Newsweek, and there's a fascinating, this is put out by somebody who believes in global warming and who is, I think if you'll read, you can hear, read underneath the, that they're covering for the scientist. On April 28, 1975, Newsweek published a provocative article, The Cooling World, in which writer and science editor Peter Gwynn described a significant chilling of the world's climate with evidence accumulating so massively that meteorologists are hard pressed to keep up with it. It doesn't sound like there's a bunch of people saying, no, 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 there's warming, does it? He raised the possibility of shorter growing seasons and poor crop yields, famine and shipping lanes blocked with ice perhaps to begin as soon as the mid-1980s. Meteorologists, he wrote, were almost unanimous. Where have we heard that before? Uh, in the opinion that our planet was getting colder. Over the years that followed, Gwynn's article became one of the most cited stories in Newsweek's history. And Gwyn was, uh, Gwyn's was no lone voice, at least in the popular press. Scores of similar articles, some with even more dire predictions of a little ice age to come, appeared during the 1970s in such mainstream publications as Time, Science Digest, the Los Angeles Time, Fortunes, the Chicago Tribune, New York Magazine, the New York Times. That's about as authoritative as you get, isn't it? Um, the Christian Science Monitor, Popular Science, and National Geographic. Global cooling is coming from everywhere. A worldwide freeze proved irresistible to feature writers prowling for a sexy news peg. Hmm, I wonder if you could do that the same with global warming. The media are having a lot of fun with this situation, observed climatologist J. Murray Mitchell, who sounds like a global cooling s skeptic. Gwynne admitted that although his article accurately captured threads of meteorological thinking threads, since they're almost unanimous, I didn't tell the full story back then. He left out the suggestive but then not conclusive evidence of CO2 increases in the atmosphere. Journalists wouldn't do that, would they? 
Um, he could not have possibly known that initiatives to reduce air pollution would quickly erase the blip of cooler temperatures in North America and help send temperatures up. Gwynn also said he was overenthusiastic in writing his Newsweek article and incorrectly suggested a connection between global cooling and severe weather in the U.S., an unjustified leap. He later said that uh, he'll probably be remembered for this uh, as his main achievement, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he was feeling sheepish about that. Well, if uh, he was not alone, you can read in Real Science, uh, RealClimateScience.com. The next ice age is definitely on its way. You can what's up with that has a whole collection of publications that you can look at online if you want, and they all talk about global cooling. One particular article is fascinating from that, and there's just the newspaper clipping right there. The prospect is literally chilling. The ultimate in climate control, 20 degrees cooler, not only inside but outdoors as well. And if by now we are accustomed, if not inert, to the physical threat of pollution, along comes a warning there may also be dire political consequences. Dr. Arnold writes, a expe an expert in the legal aspects from Cleveland's Case Western Reserve University suggests pollution or the effect to control it could be fatal to our con concept of a free society. As likely inevitable restraints on that individual and in mass, that's uh, a little awkward, but whatever, Wright suggests, this is what he's suggesting, outlawing the internal combustion engine, where have we heard that before, for vehicles and outlawing or strict, I'm sure, assume that strict, controls over all forms of combustion. Rigid controls on the marketing of new products which will require, be required to prove a minimum pollution potential. Controls on all research and development to be halted at the slightest prospect of additional pollution. Perhaps even population controls. Where have I heard that before? Uh, the number of children per family prescribed and pun punishment for exceeding the limit. They are doing that in China. In Rice's view, we will be forced to sacrifice democracy by the laws that will, be, will protect us from further pollution. Wow. Just change from global cooling to global warming. Amazing how many of those bullet points still are being advocated, which raises an interesting question. Is the advocacy really dependent on the data or superimposed on it? But this time we have it right. You know, last time they listened to the wrong scientists. Well, actually, one of them, the, the one who Walter Cronkite listened to, was the founder of the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. Yeah, the one that had Phil Jones and had uh, global warming, uh, the global warming scandal. Um, but now, 97% of scientists believe in a, a, a anthropogenic global warming. Where does that number come from? Well, was it a survey of scientists? An anonymous survey of scientists? Or maybe it was a survey of climate scientists? Well, actually, uh, there's only referen one reference that I could find that backed that up. And it's Cook, and again, you can look it up. It's Environmental Research Letters. And I'll quote the abstract. We analyzed the evolution of the scientific consensus on uh, anthropogenic global warming in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, examining 11,944, I'm assuming that is, climate abstracts from 1991 to 2011, matching the topics global climate change or global warming. We've, so apparently one of these, you know, searches. We found that 66.4% of abstracts ex expressed no opinion on global warming, 32.6% endorsed uh, global warming. Notice that these are ones that mentioned global climate change or global warming. If you wrote about something and you didn't, it was about global war, uh, something that impinged on global warming, but you didn't use the keywords, 
you didn't get counted. Which probably explains why Lindzen's articles don't appear on this. Somebody went back and looked at their data. Um, <clears throat> and 0.3% were, were uncertain about the cause of global warming. Among abstracts expressing an opinion on AGW, 97.1, well there's your 97%, endorsed the consensus position that humans are causing global warming. Well that's not good enough. So what did they do? In a second phase of this study, we invited authors to rate their own papers. Compared to abstract ratings, a smaller percentage, in other words, we call you up and say, do you believe in global warming? Is it man-made? A smaller percentage of self-rated papers expressed no positions on a AGW, about a third now, so they cut that 66% in half. Then among self-rated papers expressing a position on global warming, 97.2 endorsed the consensus. For both abstract ratings and author self-ratings, the percentage of endorsement among papers expressing a position on global warming marginally increased over time. Our analysis indicates that the number of papers rejecting the consensus on AGW is a vanishingly small proportion of the published research. That's how 97% of scientists agree with global warming. Well, actually, it's 35% that expressed no opinion. And the weird part is that, as you have seen from what I have said so far, if somebody were to push me and I was caught up in that thing, I would have to say, yeah, I think there probably is man-made global warming. I just don't think it's the dominant factor. But I'm not sure that I would be approving what they want you to believe or what people who use this data want you to believe. Now, my own take on this is very short. I sure wouldn't bet the house that we need to, in, to institute intrusive measures to save the planet. Not Sunday observance, not the Green New Deal. Now, I do observe the Sabbath, and so technically I'm doing what they want. But, you know, and there are other things that I do that are considered green, including I do have um, uh, solar panels that supply probably 95 plus percent of my electricity. Uh, not cap and trade. I think that the use of climate change for the furtherance of quasi-religious aims, whether Sunday observance or the Green New Deal or anything like that, is not really valid. Those things may be a good idea on other grounds, but I don't think you can support it using climate change. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. The journals are peer review uh, journals that would not allow certain articles to even be uh, presented. Um, let's see. Actually, let's go and look at that because the uh, we have proof that people were interfering with uh, with uh, journal opinions. Uh, let's see. And this is 2013, so we have proof that it was happening in 2006. So, um, that means that um, uh, there was blocking before that happened. So, yeah, there's another filter. You know, it's amazing if you set out to pick cherries, you'll find cherries. Comment behind. Yeah, could you go back to that graph of the solar output compared with solar uh, surface temperatures? Sure. Um, let's see, way faster to do it this way. I think this is the one you wanted? No. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that's the hurricane one. Uh, let's try it again. Uh, this is the one you wanted. Yeah, so that top, uh, the top graph? Yeah. 
So that's, that's pretty good. That's solar output. That's watts per meter squared. So the amount of solar incidence yeah. per square meter. I, I would say that's not just good. I think that's you know some of the strongest correlations that we see with data. Yeah, um, but to be fair, it's not some of the weaker correlations we've seen either. So, uh, you know, and you'd like to have it be totally uh, 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 you'd like to have it be totally reproducible. And 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 there are some graphs that are not as good as that, as well as graphs that are better. That's. Pretty, that's pretty good, though. That's extremely strong correlation. Whatever the, what is R squared or something like that, I think it's going to be very high. Yeah. Um, but what I'd also like to point out is the inflection points between those two data sets is interesting. That is, when one inflex goes up or goes down, the other does too, which means there's a temporal correlation between those two data sets. Yeah. And not only that, but the slope of the data between those inflection points is approximately the same too. So I would say that's not only a strong correlation, but actually when you look at the additional factors that you look for for actually suggesting causation, I think that graph is showing those, those factors too. Well, I, I think that you could say they're both correlated to something else, but right. uh, it's pretty hard to imagine how, uh, let's say, the... Uh, surface of the Arctic is influencing the temperature of the sun or the, uh, the, uh, the total output of the sun. Right. So it seems like it would pretty much have to be the other way around. Right. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is good. Just be warned that if you use it, you're going to get piled on by a bunch of people who will show other graphs that aren't as good. And, uh, uh, and somewhat fairly. So don't, I mean, uh, it's a nice graph, but you want to be, you want to be a little cautious about saying that this proves everything we need to prove. Well, I, I guess my question would be, why does this graph show such strong correlation, including the temporal correlation? I mean, there needs to be an explanation for that if there's not a causation going on here. Uh, don't know that I have a good answer for that. Why it, why it does better for the Arctic than it does for general temperature, I don't know. Although I will say that there is a blip in the 1972 well, is when it went down, and that's of course when you get all the global cooling scares. There were a couple of winters that were really, really cold during that time period, and that's why Newsweek and everybody picked up on it, and that's why the, the population was receptive to the, that kind of uh, uh, claim that we were heading towards a new ice age. But what I would uh, just go, like to point out on this graph as well is that is typically this correlation is rejected by the, the climate alarmists for the reason that the solar incidence is called the solar constant and the amount of variation, if you look at those numbers there, this is varying between, say, 1369 and uh, 1372, let's say. Uh, Percentage-wise, it's not, it's not that great. Um, and so my understanding is, is that the variation in output, you know, watts output from the sun, cannot explain the difference that we've seen in the temperature changes on the surface of the Earth. Yeah, although, you know, if, if you're going to argue that way, then uh, you could say, well, maybe there's some positive feedback of where you influence other things, such as cloud cover because you right. have more heat or something. So, uh, I, I mean, if you can do that for carbon dioxide, it seems like it would be reasonable to, to argue that way. Maybe there's a combined effect. And in some data sets, that little blip is much narrower than what it's shown there. Let's see, I think we had a comment here. <coughs> if, uh, if my understanding is right, the uh, glaciers have been steadily melting for quite a long time. How does that fit into this? Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to ask, did the glaciers make a short advance during the 60s and 70s? 
uh, to correlate with the um, uh, to correlate with that little blip in the temperature. And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe somebody else does. I think uh, there is evidence that glaciers that originate at high altitude have been advancing uh, during the last uh, 15 or 20 years. The ones that originate at low altitude have been um, melting back. Melting back. Um, but the explanation for that that's usually given is that this is what we would expect. And <laughs> the reason we are supposed to expect it is that um, there is going to be more evaporation and the 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 uh, glaciers that are originating at higher altitude are getting more snow. They're getting more warm. snow. Yeah. Now I would feel much more comfortable if somebody, let's say, 20 years before this, started saying this is what we would expect. Somehow, expectations after the fact seem to be malleable, shall we say? If you look at this graph where, where, the, uh, where it says sun at the very top of that one peak, and you do the 30-year average going down from where the little point says sun, and you do the 30-year average, you could see that they could postulate from that 30-year average that the uh, temperature could uh, continue, to, continue to drop. So that 30-year average could be actually working against them uh, when you look at this particular graph starting at the point where the sun is at that peak. You know, the, the odd thing is, I would feel much more comfortable with a one-year average. Uh, and the reason I say that is because when you do 30 years, you're smoothing out everything. And if you think about it, what's really happening at 30 years is you're Every time you move one year, you're chopping off 30 years before, and you're adding 30, uh, pardon me, 15 years before, and you're adding 15 years after. That's what you're really doing, is you are not really measuring. I mean, it, it's a blunt instrument, but, but the part that it does measure is what happened 15 years before and 15 years after. And if you have a sudden El Nino, then what will happen is when you get to the El Nino, 15 years before you get to the El Nino, you'll suddenly have a rise. 15, minute, 15 years after the El Nino, you're going to see a, a drop. So it's, if you think about it, 30-year average is not nearly as good, I think, as a, as a one-year average. You know, Because then what you've done is you've averaged out the climate over the year, and when you see a peak, it actually means, I think, a little more. But I think that doing it month to month is crazy because this stuff gets swamped by you know, the summer to winter average. And if you're trying to take an average temperature, you really don't want to do uh, month to month. Or, or you'll get, uh, you know, a any signal will get lost in the noise. Why Paul? Do Paul? Pardon? Yes. Um, when you look at the geologic literature in general, there's been a feeling that temperatures were much warmer in the past than they are at present. Now, that's, this is not very good data. It is uh, subject to speculations based upon other speculations. Yes, and, and, and so the answer to mm -hmm. Vinland and, uh, and Greenland mm -hmm. was that uh, Eric... The Red was a, uh, um, a, a land salesman of less than uh, perfect uh, uh, integrity. And so when he said Vinland, there weren't really vines there. When he mm -hmm. said Greenland, it wasn't really green there. And uh, although you'd think that after rowing, you know, however many miles across the ocean when people got to Greenland and they found out that it was all ice all the way out to the, to the coast, that they would um, <coughs> not be too happy about the land they'd sold and he might not last very long at that point. But um, there is a little bit of data that uh, does suggest that uh, warming may not be too, uh, caused by anthropogenic 
anthropocentric uh, activity. Uh, above the Arctic Circle now, uh, you can find uh, salamander skeletons. And so, and you can say, well, maybe global warming, I mean, uh, global migration was involved in this and so on. It's a very complicated picture. Yeah, uh, I, I have left out entirely the arguments for and against based on how long, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, because, <clears throat> because those ones, of course, involve assumptions that uh, I'm not sure I really want to go there at this point, but there are certain people who have argued that, well, when the temperature goes up, the carbon mm -hmm. dioxide goes up and vice versa. Um, and the only problem with that theory is that for the measurements they're doing, the carbon dioxide seems to follow the temperature rather mm -hmm. than vice versa. And that the cooling starts when you have lots of carbon dioxide, which if carbon dioxide is the forcing uh, variable, makes no sense. The, the carbon mm -hmm. dioxide should start to fall when, uh, before the temperature mm -hmm. does. But, but lo looking a little further into the geological record, uh, in Antarctica they have found palm trees. Now you can't attribute that to uh, continental drift, because Antarctica is at least considered to have been one of the more stable uh, parts of the Earth's surface and so on. And uh, it, there is that data that suggests that uh, you can have warming without uh, anthropological contributions. Yeah, well, the, in fact, if you look at the, the climate of the world in general, uh, in the, uh, you know, once you get past the Ice Age, you actually have a lot of evidence for a warmer climate in general. And so that suggests that you know, in the, uh, let's say, the Mesozoic, whenever that was, uh, the temperature was higher than it is now. And uh, the same for the Paleozoic and so forth. Uh, now, now you're starting to get into some very interesting arguments. And, and of course, how you deal with, you know, whether it's creation or evolution starts to, starts to, uh, uh, influence how you interpret some of this stuff. Uh, but certainly, if you go back far enough, it pre pretty much everybody concedes that the, the Jurassic was pretty warm. Yes? Do you see any similarities between the way human-caused global warming is packaged and sold and how evolution as an explanatory mechanism is packaged and sold? Yes, and as a matter of fact, you find some of the same things happening. This uh, Roy, um, I forgot what his Spencer. last name was. Spencer. Spencer, who uh, is act actually at the University of Alabama, started out as a global warming believer and started out as a, uh, an evolutionist of the standard variety. And with time, he came to question both of them and finds that there's some overlap in the, uh, in the way they're presented. So yeah, I think that's probably fair that, uh, that uh, we're possibly seeing again the same kind of problem, that uh, people have an agenda and they're making science fit it, and there are, they're using punitive measures to uh, enforce the way they believe uh, and, you know, anybody who doubts that, just read the emails from East Anglia. And on the other side, read the emails that uh, came out of the um, uh, Cal State Northridge uh, group when they were firing Mike Armitage. Uh, when that came out and people actually, you know, what they said in private came out in public, don't email anything that's derogatory. <laughs> just for what it's worth, <laughs> because it looks bad when it comes out. 
I was wondering if you might be able to comment on a graph from Dr. Soon's presentation. Uh, it was one of the references you included. Yeah. And he, there was an interesting graph that showed the correlation between increasing carbon in the atmosphere and the actual greenhouse effect and how even though there's been an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect has remained relatively flat. Well, I think soon sometimes overstates his data a little bit, uh, but, but it is interesting because if you don't assume, if you assume, don't assume that there is feedback, that all you get out of carbon dioxide is what you put in, then you have to have something else to help move the graph because clearly there's been warming. Even though maybe it isn't totally as much as what people have said, um, I would say at least half of the data is real. Uh, when you can measure something that hasn't moved uh, and those, that satellite data, you know, that collects things from everywhere. Uh, I think you do get uh, some indication that there has been some warming. It's just not as much as what everybody expected and the, and the satellites were supposed to pick up the most sensitive part because they're measuring actually the temperature in the lower atmosphere. So again, would you expect a increasing greenhouse effect with the increasing temperatures? I guess what I'm getting at is that if there's other explanations for increasing just raw temperatures, that could be explained through other mechanisms like solar activity rather than the CO2. Well, there's a, there's a huge elephant in the room that usually isn't discussed and is usually just put into the computer model as a multiplier factor. But the truth of the matter is that the single biggest that swamps all other, all other greenhouse gases is water vapor. What happens with water vapor when you heat up the atmosphere? Well, there's more of it. And I guess you could say that that's a multiplier effect, but it would multiply solar activity just as well as it would multiply um, uh, carbon dioxide and you know if carbon dioxide doesn't fit the finer stuff and some measures of solar activity do it makes you wonder uh, comment back here all, all of, <coughs> excuse me all the predictions are based on on uh, computer models and there has been um, as I understand it uh, a plethora of models those models have had an opportunity to work with data for the last 15 20 30 years are any of them doing much better than the rest and if so what are they predicting for the next 50 years well, the climate change people tend not to want to revisit the computer models. If they revisit anything, uh, I mean, Wikipedia spent, a, you know, a good page and a half trying to convince me that what I saw in 1972 wasn't real. Uh, that was the the real climate scientist actually knew. You know, it seems like somebody would say, "Wait a minute." Uh, actually, we do have egg on our face, and it's best if we wipe it off a little bit. Uh, certainly, the uh, the popular press did, and there were uh, the popular press doesn't step out doing this out of whole cloth. Somebody told them. So there was a significant portion, maybe it's a minority, you can make it that argument, but if it was a minority, I'd like to have somebody say, and this article, and this article, and this article, and this article said, uh, don't worry about global cooling. And everybody listened to the two people who said there was global cooling. If I had something like that, I'd feel a little more comfortable, but boy, 
you read the uh, journal people and they seem to be saying, yeah, and I talked to everybody that I talked to almost universally said. I wonder if they'd pull out 97%. Come to think of it, I think 97% of, uh, of uh, scientists believe that, uh, uh, or at least evolutionary biologists uh, believe that uh, intelligent design is not a good e explanation for what's going on. 97% sounds like a great number to settle on. It's sort of almost like 99% chimp. You know, I remember going to the um, exhibits at the Smithsonian Institute inst in about 1970, and there was a whole section on global cooling, and they had graphs and predictions, and they didn't get around to changing that until um, about 10 years ago. It was well into the global warming uh, phase before Smithsonian got around to changing its exhibit on on predictions. But I, I was really looking for um, sophisticated models of the last 15 or 20 years. There are some, there must be some that are doing better than others with the data that, that we've got for the last 20 years. The only place where I saw that uh, done was on a climate denier website, so you take it for what it's worth. Um, but uh, said that there were three major sets of models that, that were presented by, I think it was James Hansen. And one of them was, we're going to keep going up exponentially. One of them is, we're going to keep going up but, but level, uh, you know, at a steady rate. And one of them is, we're going to level off where we are in terms of how much uh, temperature rise we get. And the one that fit the data best was the one that said we were going to level off. But of course, we didn't do that. And in fact, the carbon dioxide is going up as if it was exponential, but the temperature leveled off. Uh, I mean, if you fit it to the actual data we have. Uh, and that suggests that maybe the climate change models were a little overenthusiastic. And uh, there was one other website that said, here is, you know, because there's hundreds of actual models. And they had a, you know, 95% confidence limits kind of thing. And that if it were not for the El Nino of 2018, well, we had actually crawled off into the lowest 5%. And then the El Nino put us back up into the main area. And then now in 2019, it's cooled again, and we're back out again. So it suggests that maybe the climate models were a little over-enthusiastic. The, there was another graph Dr. Moon showed. I don't know if you could comment on it, where they, they tried to use some of their modeling to predict actual seasonal temperature changes on a, some kind of a plot graph and there was probably at least 50 different models they used to try to predict out you know a certain number of years where using their modeling where they thought seasonal temperature should be um, you mean that, in, instead of doing this for 20 years you're actually going to do it for the next three months no it was over a period of years just as a way of showing how accurate their modeling really was to real life changes that you could measure over time. But it was, but it was on a on a on a year to year basis rather than on a month. Uh, yeah, it was seasonal. Uh, seasonal, right? At any rate, the out. graph he showed what uh, their modeling could not even do a good job predicting seasonal weather patterns for the next few years in advance, let well, alone try to say where the Earth is going to be 10 years from now yeah. when everything is supposed to end. Well, uh, it's, uh, the world will end, I'm, I'm sure of that, but <laughs> yes, uh, go ahead. What? Oh, did I miss somebody? Anyway, this yeah. won't take long. I haven't heard anything about the... 
Oh, okay. No, that was where I was going with it. I haven't heard anything about the raising, uh, water raising. Uh, back in Maryland, where I come from, the uh, islands in the Chesapeake Bay are disappearing. Uh, these were pe people had homes on them and everything, and now they're in ha not habitable. Uh, what about this? What's causing all this uh, water that's rising? Water rising is a mixed picture. Um, the nearest that I can read is that it's gone up about two feet average. Now, of course, tides do more than that, so this is it's difficult to s sort the noise from the signal, but it looks, like, it looks like it's actually going up. But the prediction is 25 feet if all of Greenland melts, so that's panicking people who live near the coast and understandably so. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but it's moving in that direction. Uh, that's one of the drawbacks that would happen with a, a warmer climate, and I think it should be taken somewhat seriously. Uh, but, yeah, it's one of the things you can see. And uh, the one thing that you have to keep in mind is that it's highly variable that in, in Norway, for example, the sea level is actually dropping. Probably because Norway is rebounding from being uh, you know, covered with ice for so long. And it was pushed down, and so now it's slowly coming back up. Uh, so it's not, it's not a total picture. Uh, if Greenland were to melt, uh, Antarctica probably doesn't matter because most of that stuff is, is floating anyway, especially the, the Ross Ice Shelf. And if it melts, it's not going to really change much. But Greenland will change because there is actually uh, you know, ice that's stuck up above the water that's not already floating, and so uh, you'll get quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, sea level rise from Greenland melting. And it also raises the interesting question, what about things like Baffin Island and stuff like that? Uh, you know, I didn't even touch, there are a lot of things we could have covered, uh, like, like the polar bears are actually uh, coming back. They're, they're getting more more populated rather than less. Why is that? I don't know that anybody knows for sure, but the fact of the matter is it is, and the person who publicized that wound up getting fired from her job. Yeah, so, think that they're gone. They're just that's right, and uh, the, the polar bears are just uh, tearjerkers for the little kids, and you know, it's just a shame, except that it's not a shame. They're actually doing pretty well however they're surviving. Um, so there's a lot of cross currents and it's hard to make things really simple uh, because it's a complex world. And in fact, that, I think that's one of the problems is that, that in order to make it impactful, people have made it simple. And I don't really think it is that simple. but. Maybe we'll make this the last one here. He, he, there's a, a, a mic there. Thank you. Um, I kind of uh, picture this as, as kind of a ship that's heading in a certain direction. All the scientists are on the ship and they're, they're debating what's true and what isn't. Doesn't matter. It's going, in the, it's going in the direction it's going. And uh, so the Pope getting involved with this and uh, calling the world leaders together next May, uh, what the scientific arguments are, are no longer valid because it's gonna happen. How long did global warming la last at the Smithsonian after people <laughs> yeah. pretty much abandoned it? Yeah. So, uh, you know, just uh, don't expect this to turn around in the next, uh, you know, this video is not going to change. 
uh, nothing's, in my opinion, nothing's going to change. It's it's going where it's going, uh, simply by uh, the uh, the world taking it that way yeah. for uh, yeah. obvious reasons other than just scientific. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll uh, see you, those of you who can make it next week.